This episode is sponsored by Zoom Care. Have you been putting off a visit to the doctor for way too long? Yeah, I do that too. And when I finally do call to make an appointment, the doctor's office usually tells me the next available appointment is months away. That's why I've started going to Zoom Care. With locations in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Colorado, Zoom Care offers same day doctor visits that you can book online or from their app. They even offer mental health visits where you can speak to a board certified mental health provider in person or through video. If you're ready to make an appointment, head to zoomcare.com. I'm Cassidy Quinn, and this is Mentally Together. Because whether you can see it on the surface or not, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. And no matter what our brains are experiencing, we're not alone, we're together. Taking care of our mental health is tough. I mean, it's kind of the reason we're all here, right? And by here, I mean wherever you are watching or listening to this podcast right now. Sometimes we really procrastinate the whole taking care of our mental health thing. Well, I'll speak for myself. Every time my brain gets to a bad spot, whether it was a couple of years ago when my depression really started taking over my days, or last year when I couldn't get anything done working from home because my ADHD symptoms got way worse, it always does take me a while to actually go and seek help. Part of that is because sometimes it's really hard to find help. I don't know where to go, who to ask, or what the right thing is for me. Part of it is because sometimes even when you do go seek professional help, it can take forever to get a call back and actually get scheduled. A few episodes back, I mentioned that I have never actually been to therapy. And believe me, since then, I have been trying very hard, but I still have not found someone that's the right fit and is accepting new clients. And then another part of me often waiting too long to get help is the fact that sometimes I don't think I need it. Like, oh, it's not that bad. I'm still somewhat functioning as a human. And you know, I'm really busy. I got a lot going in my life, so this can wait. Just add that to the procrastination list. Oh, and speaking of lists, sometimes just making that appointment turns into an entire list of things like Google therapists, email therapists, call potential therapists to follow up, leave voicemail for potential therapists, and then they never call back. <sighs> yep, that's, that's what I've been doing lately. <laughs> so unless this entire seeking help process can become easy for me, I just won't do it. Or at least I'll wait too long until I'm really struggling, literally cannot function at all, and then obviously that makes it even harder to take the steps to get help. But it actually happened. Some parts of this process actually became easy for me because I started going to Zoom Care. As you heard me say at the beginning, this episode is sponsored by Zoom Care. That is where I went in October 2020 for my ADHD diagnosis. Now, I have heard so many horror stories of people with ADHD going to talk to a doctor and it not going well at all. The doctor not taking their symptoms seriously or the process taking hours or even months. And that is so not what I experienced at Zoom Care. The doctor was super nice. She listened to me ramble on and on. She asked me a bunch of questions. She understood that I was struggling and actually helped. Not to mention the fact that I booked my appointment on my phone in like 30 seconds and then the actual appointment was 30 minutes long, no longer, which just gave me extra time to have an emotional breakdown on my way home wondering how I did not figure out that I have ADHD sooner. (laughs) I'm kidding, but actually not really. My guest today is one of those doctors at Zoom Care. He hasn't been my doctor, but if you live in Portland, you can go see him at Zoom Care. It's Dr. Eric Vanderlip. Dr. Vanderlip is the chief medical officer at Zoom Care. He's a board certified family physician and psychiatrist who wants to engineer our healthcare system to make it easy for every person to get seamless access to the information they need to change their lives for the better. At Zoom Care, he is engineering integrated behavioral health, urgent, primary, telemedicine, and specialty care services to coincide with advanced chronic care models that engage patients and promote health behavior change. 
He specializes in designing services for the chronic care of medically and psychiatrically complex individuals. I loved talking to him about making mental health care accessible, how to know when to ask for help, and his advice for anyone struggling right now. So let's get into it with Zoom Care's Dr. Vanderlip. Thank you for being here. I'm super stoked to be with you, Cassidy. This is a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, I'm really looking forward to be, being on your show. Thank you. Thank you. Me too. Thank you so much. And thank you for so much for Zoom Care for being a sponsor of the podcast. We appreciate you very much. Yeah, I think you're just actually covering a really, really important topic. And it's important to get this stuff out there in the world. And so uh, we're, we're delighted to be able to support this. Well, you guys are making the important things happen. So, you know, we can talk about it, but then actually being able to go get help and get treatment is the next level. So thank you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for anyone listening that is not familiar with Zoom Care, what is Zoom Care exactly? It's such a great question. What is Zoom Care? Zoom Care is this on-demand, multi-specialty healthcare platform, ecosystem. It's like a new way of getting healthcare services. And, and you can just, all you have to do is download the app. You just go to the app and you can see all the menu of services and how to get stuff, anything, anything from texting and chatting with our docs to video appointments to in-person appointments and anything from physical therapy or massage or chiropractic care to women's health care to urgent primary care to near emergency level care staffed by our emergency docs at our super clinics to mental health care. Um, and each of those channels are available by text, chat, in-person video, um, et cetera. So it's kind of a, a unique ecosystem of on-demand health. Yeah, I remember when Zoom Care first popped up in Portland, where I live, and I thought it was just urgent care. Then I started realizing, oh, I can go get my flu shot there, which was very uh -huh. handy. And then it wasn't until last year that I discovered, oh, you guys do. Like you just said, you offer mental health services, which is, that's when you actually got brought in to Zoom Care, right? To help create yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It was about five years ago that uh, we started having discussions, um, myself and Zoom Care. And at the point of, at that point in time, they were really looking for somebody to, who was kind of a, an engineer for healthcare services. And, uh, you know, I'm a psychiatrist by training as well as a family physician. I've been thinking a lot about how you engineer and design healthcare services for populations. And so this was a good fit. And I was brought in to build the behavioral health team and system at Zoom Care. Wow. And so what kind of services in that lane does Zoom Care actually offer? Zoom Care actually offers a breadth of ambulatory behavioral health care services. Ambulatory is like walk-in in the outpatient clinic kind of space. Pretty much anything that you're struggling with from emotions, thoughts, or behaviors, you could start with a mental health care appointment at Zoom Care. Um, and we really have tried to make um, an a no wrong door policy for anybody coming in at any point in time, really any, even anywhere in the Zoom system, not even with our mental health team in particular. The whole team's designed and built to help guide people to the right level of care and service, depending on what their problem they're trying to solve is for that day. There are a couple of things that we, we don't do, and that's mainly in the realm of certain prescriptions that we can't send out. And those mainly have to do with medication-assisted therapy for opioid use disorders or persons who are struggling with overcoming addiction to opioids. And those are narcotic pain medications or things like heroin, stuff like that. We, we cannot uh, prescribe those at this point in time. Um, and we also don't do some injectable medications for mental health, and we do not prescribe benzodiazepine medications. The, the common street names for those are Valium, Xanax, et cetera. Oh, okay. But we do almost prescribe nearly everything else, including stimulant medications. We focus on really good, solid evidence-based care and treatment for pretty much anything. And if we can't solve it ourselves at Zoom, we'll route you around to the right place of care within our communities to get you connected. And I know that there... There's so many hurdles for people getting help for their mental health. One of them is just that it's hard to get in. And just, I mean, if you get past all of the other hurdles, the stigma, the financial component, then actually getting in. But with Zoom Care, you just go online and you can't even plan like a month in advance. You can't be put on a wait list for six months from now because the only appointments are in the next few days. And it seems like that would probably make a big difference for a lot of people, because if you're struggling, yeah. I know even for myself, like if I get into a big 
depression period in a week, if I don't write down exactly how I felt in that moment, I might forget it. And then by the time I get in to see a therapist, I'm like, wait, I don't know. I think I was sad when I called you, but I'm kind of feeling okay now. But with Zoom care, it's like, oh, I'm yeah. sad now. I can come in essentially now, right? Like that yeah. day. Yeah. Yes. And you can come in same day, seven days a week. Can you imagine if you had asthma and you were wheezing and you were coughing and somebody was like, great, we'll put you on a waiting list to get you in in six weeks. Super it's insane. helpful. Yeah, yeah you'd, you'd wind up, where would you wind up? The emergency room. You'd go mm -hmm. to the hospital. You'd go, you know, you'd, you'd struggle through it. And then when you're finally ready to go in six weeks later, oh, you seem better. You're no longer wheezing. Well, heck yeah, because I had to give up that job working in that smoky bar or, or I had to give up that job in the hayfield or it's just allergy season and my, and my asthma and I had to stay inside all day long and HEPA filters in my house and I can't go anywhere. And I'll just wait six weeks and totally redo my life. You wouldn't expect that for asthma and you shouldn't expect it for your mood. Um, and that's one of the hardest things I think people, you know, your mood will ebb and flow. Your focus, your concentration, your ability to perceive of yourself as being functional will ebb and flow like any other condition like asthma. And so, so you shouldn't have to wait. And if you're really wondering when you need to get started or how to get started with addressing some of your own problems that you might be having with mood, thoughts, or behaviors, there's no time like the present. We wanna be able to capitalize on that, to take advantage of how you're feeling now and really help you understand if it is a problem, if it isn't a problem. And then if it is something worthy of really formal help or care, we're, we're gonna offer up a range of pathways and options for you to choose from. And that could include therapy, it can, could include medications, kind of your, your choices, how, how, how you wanna move your journey through and towards recovery. Yeah, that's awesome and amazingly helpful for people. It's, as I've told you, it's been very helpful for me even getting my own mental health help at Zoom Care through my ADHD diagnosis. So thank you mm -hmm. to you guys <laughs> for making mm -hmm. it so much easier. Are a lot of those hurdles to people getting mental health help kind of what you brought, what brought you into, into this field and to Zoom Care? Yes and yes. Um, you know, growing up in medicine when I was in um, undergrad and then as I, as I got into medical school, I discovered personally that persons with schizophrenia who suffer uh, will also have heart attacks in their 40s and 50s. Um, and that kind of statistic blew my mind. You know, I thought that yeah. the reason somebody with schizophrenia would die would be because they, had, they were exposed to the elements or from uh, substance overuse or, or, I don't know, pneumonia. And I was totally wrong. They die from the natural causes, natural causes, I put in quotations, that, that most other Americans die at just as a, at a far more accelerated rate. And so I thought I wanted to give myself the ability to give back to communities. Um, that was important to me at a very personal level because um, I grew up in a fairly nice, healthy household um, and I wanted to be able to give back. And that was that that particular patient population seemed like one of the best ways that I could focus my life and career. That's what really got me started in the field of mental health. Um, that plus the fact that I just think mental health is fascinating um, intellectually. And that sounds weird to say it, but I, <laughs> I love working with people with mental health uh, challenges. I love helping to destigmatize mental health um, for them, both internally and externally. I love trying to do good care and treatment for it. And it just is, it's just a fascinating area of medicine for me. Yeah, it's very fascinating the more that I learn about it. So that's something I didn't realize a lot or hear a lot about before starting this podcast, that there is such a connection between what's happening in our brains and our bodies and the mental and the physical, and that these things that happen in our brains can actually lead to us dying or just having some kind of other physical struggle. There yeah. really is a huge connection between those two. Yeah. It's huge. It turns out your brain, your mind, and your body are connected. It's called your neck. Um, <laughs> and the, there's a huge conduit. Your hormones, your stress, how you manage all that can have definite deleterious impacts on your physical health and vice versa. If you're, if you're in pain, if your physical health is not good and your body's health is not good, your mind will not be healthy either. And so it's really important to have a holistic approach when we're talking about behavioral health um, challenges. Really think through 
the whole person, all of their health problems, and think about some of those bi-directional relationships when you're forming, helping somebody to form a, a recovery pathway to feeling better. You mentioned a minute ago that there's two types of stigmas around mental health, the internal stigma yeah. and the external stigma. Can you elaborate on those a little bit? Yeah, I, I like thinking of stigma in this way, and I'm, I'm by no means a mental health stigma expert. There are actually people <laughs> who live in the world who really are experts at mental health stigma. Um, but I, I think of it in terms of internal stigma, which is the, the own biases and perceptions I bring to my own self and how I'm presenting to the world and whether or not this the symptoms that I'm having or whatever label we want to put on them, um, this label of a disorder that I might have, how I perceive of that. If I'm depressed, if I have major depressive disorder, that what does that mean to me? And the biases and the perceptions of that is like internal stigma. External stigma is the biases and impressions others might have of me with a label of depression. Um, and what that brings to their, what they're bringing to the table in our relationships and how they interact with me, that's external stigma. But from my perception of things, internal stigma is as important to address as the external stigma. And some people are much more open, but there's layers to it. There's multiple layers to it. And until you formally address all of a, an individual's internal stigma, really well and help them to understand what it means to have these things or to have this constellation of symptoms and et cetera, you're not gonna be able to help them deal with the external stigma um, very well. So I really like focusing on that when we talk about how they wanna move forward with managing this constellation of symptoms. And I'm being very vague about that because disorder <laughs> is such a limiting term, but um, their disorder, their condition, their whatever is going on to impede their functionality. Yeah. Well, and a lot of times, I mean, you, the person has to be the one to actually make the appointment. You have to be the one to actually go to Zoom care or wherever you go. And so if that internal stigma is stopping you, you just won't go. And you told me when we talked the other day that, that in a lot of cases, there's people, there's people coming to Zoom care for the first time that they've ever gone out and asked for help and received help for their mental health, right? Yeah, I love, I, you know, every Thursday afternoon, I do mental health clinic right now at, at Zoom, and I see patients, I see persons directly, um, and, and I love it, because so often is the case, especially in new, new client appointments, new patient appointments, I'll say, you know, have you ever seen somebody for behavioral health before, and they'll say, no, this is my first ever behavioral health visit, and I'll just, we'll, I'll want to take a pause, <laughs> holy, whole stop, full stop, and say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I can't believe that. Like, I feel so privileged that you've chosen me to come in and get started on this process. And Aww. I don't even know what's going on yet, but I know that that's a big, huge first step. And it's really going to be a delight for me to be able to work with you around this. And I, and like I just all the other honor... doctors do a parade through the office. <laughs> <laughs> I want to do a parade. And sometimes <laughs> on video, it's hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, um, true. But it is, it is delightful. And we want to make it a, a kind of thing where people come in and they, they feel welcome. They feel absolutely accepted. And they feel like there's no wrong door approach, like I mentioned, and that we will absolutely help to work with them to feel better and, and get their, get unstuck from wherever they're stuck. You were talking about how it's that internal stigma often is one of the rate limiting steps for people seeking help and care. Yeah. You're totally right. And in fact, I think there's a huge, some people also call it insight, but insight assumes that somebody, there's a right or a wrong to it. And unless you have insight, you're wrong until you have insight in your condition. I don't think it's that black and huh. white, but I think insight or understanding of how you're feeling and being able to then control that is so closely tied with achieving an outcome and feeling like you're empowered and you can recover from this stuff that that's totally what we're trying to do at Zoom. You know, we're really in essence, putting people in control of dictating how they want to get a hold of us and when and they are wholly in charge of navigating their recovery with a lot, as much or as little assistance from us as they want. But ultimately at Zoom, they're in the driver's seat. And you as a person can decide who you want to get your consult from, how you want to do it, how often you want to do it, 
And you can decide if you want to take that advice or leave it. Um, sometimes <laughs> people leave it and that's totally <laughs> fine, but we're available and there for whenever they're feeling like they're stuck. And that's the point. And it's seven days a week, sometimes after hours in the evenings. Um, yeah. Because mental that's health- That's one of the best parts, I think. Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of times, yeah. oh, you want to go to the doctor? It has to be between nine and five. Monday through Friday and a lot of people are kind of busy during those hours so it's not like you just have time to go to the therapist in the middle of the day <laughs> it's also the case that let's say it's between Mon Monday through Friday nine to five but like, there's no guarantee it's starting on time and you can yeah. show up in your appointments at one but uh you're there until 3 30 or something because they didn't get you in until two and the doc was running late and you just kind of assume that's the way it's going to be i'm going to take the whole afternoon off but 95 percent of our appointments start on time and we're very yes. efficient like we don't spend a lot of time you know beating around the bush here we're going <laughs> to be like what's the issue let's get into it man we assume that you're here to start talking about stuff um, and let's get to the bottom of figuring it out so that we can get you unstuck so that you can get about your life. That's the whole point. Totally. I love that about Zoom care. A lot of times I have to tone down my own talking though, because I'm like, oh shoot, there's a half an hour and I better stop talking if I want to get help here. <laughs> Yeah, we we try to we had we try to have a very curated process through it all, uh, and we'll help people sort out what's going on if they can't if they have a difficult time putting it together themselves. <laughs> so if someone comes in yeah. for the first time and they see you, a lot of times do you end up saying seeing the same person again, or the next time they come in, do they see a different doctor, or is that your choice as the person coming in for help, or how does that work? I mean, it is really up to the person seeking help and services. Um, you can schedule up to 30 days in advance. And most people, I'd say seven out of 10 times will pick the same person they saw that they started with. So they don't feel like they're having to reinvent the wheel uh, with somebody new. But at Zoom, we have this philosophy like the Zoom care team is your doctor. And so if you are stuck and you need help on a Saturday and the first person that you started with, Dr. Awesome, is not available on Saturday, we don't want you waiting until Tuesday to get back in touch with Dr. Awesome or leave them a message. We're just going to put you straight in front of the next teammate who's up. And we, we work really hard behind the scenes to make sure that our team is top notch and that everybody who plays in the Zoom sandbox is, is potty trained and a great <laughs> teammate. That um, uh, they really know their stuff, that they're very engaging, nice people, that they really make sure that you feel listened to, um, and that we're really digging into the problem of the day and really helping you overcome that. Awesome. What would you say to someone listening right now that hasn't yet gone for their first behavioral health appointment to any doctor? What would you say to someone who's maybe a little nervous about it and thinking, oh, this is probably a good idea, but uh, it's kind of scary. Um, I'd say making the appointment is the hardest part. Um, and if you can download the app and go through <laughs> pushing the button and setting up your account and finding a time to meet, that is the hardest thing. Um, and once you're past that, it is so much easier. You know, I speak with a lot of folks who are nervous with their first appointment. They've had bad first appointments with other providers. And um, I always think that's an opportunity for us to knock it out of the park and really make sure they feel listened to and really make sure that we're, we're, we're putting together our best advice and guidance um, that we can give them. And if you're out there and you're thinking about making an appointment, frankly, in my experience, most of the time, you could have made an appointment a while back. Um, mm -hmm. If you're contemplating if you should come in or not, it's probably well past time when you could have benefited from a consult earlier. And it doesn't mean that you have to go forth and do anything. It doesn't mean that you have to start a medication. It doesn't mean that you have to start therapy with somebody. We present a range of options for people and then they pick and choose what sounds best to them, their values and their life. So it's a convenient way to get started. And if you're thinking about making an appointment, I'd say it's probably well past time that you could have just come in. How, how do we know? How does someone know like, okay, it is time. I should probably go get help now. Obviously there's not just one answer and there's a million different answers and a million things people could be feeling, but is there anything that people have said maybe that's like, oh, this is, this is time. It's time to go. <laughs> 
Yeah, most people will come in when they're really starting to struggle and getting get even some of the basics done. They're starting to struggle in their performance at work. Their relationship is not going well and they're looking down the potential of a breakup. And that's when they'll come in because they're, some, they're, they're really close to being on the precipice of some significant life changes mm -hmm. as a result of their, their pattern of mood or their pattern of their behavior or, or their thoughts are always getting in the way of them accomplishing their goals and where they'd like to be with things. So I'd, I'd say that that's probably a clear line in the sand when, when something's really starting to look at life altering events because of your mood, thoughts, or behaviors, it's time to get mm -hmm. in. I'd also say that sometimes when there's a hurricane going on in your life, because you're the center of it, it can feel kind of calm, like the eye of the hurricane. Ooh, and, uh -huh. and to you, to you, not that much is really wrong. It's, it's this guy's concern, or it's my spouse's problem, or it's my boss is yelling at me. But it, those are each of those data points are like little buoys out in the ocean around you. And if those weather buoys, if you've got four weather buoys in your life going off saying there's high winds and high rain, and it looks <laughs> like a hurricane, and all four of those weather buoys are in your life, maybe you're the hurricane. Um, <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes I think we, because of internal stigma and other things, we can be a little blind to how our mood, thoughts, behaviors, emotions are coming across to others, how that's in turn impacting their, their response to us. And what we are more likely to do is blame them for things because that's just easier. It's not our, mm -hmm. it's not our problem to solve. So I see a fair bit of that too. So maybe then there's also people listening who are that other person, the spouse, the coworker, the friend that's noticing changes in somebody's mood and how they're functioning. And it's really hard to have those conversations and bring it up and, and say, Hey, I'm, I'm noticing maybe there's something going on. Uh, do you have any advice for people who notice it in, in the other people in their lives? Yeah, that's a good question. I'd say that on the flip side of the curtain, it's not infrequent that somebody's had somebody else in their life stand up and say, hey, look, something's really off here. You need, you need to get in and see somebody. Oftentimes, some of the most effective friends and family interventions come from people who have lived through that experience themselves. Mm -hmm. They've struggled with their own anxiety, depression, attention deficit focus, and they've shared their own personal experiences in solidarity with this person struggling. That can be very helpful, but ultimately it comes down to, I think your relationship with that person. Um, are you in a place where you can be authentic with them and, and confide your observations without them getting too defensive? And some people aren't quite there in their relationships and it would be awkward and kind of inappropriate for you to just intervene and say, hey, I think this is off or you seem wrong. Yeah. And, for anybody who might intervene like that, you should check your own emotions and your own motivations for doing that before the intervention. Are you really doing it on their behalf or is it something about you? Are you hoping to gain something from this? And if you're hoping to gain something from it, okay, but let's check that and make sure that the number one priority is that other person's health, well being, safety, et cetera. And if you can leave all of your own initiatives at the door, come into the room and space authentically as a caring, loving person, say, and just make clear observations as to what you've seen and offer your support and help, then that's probably the best way to do it. That is really interesting to think about your motivation for having that conversation. That makes a lot of sense, but I would guess that's something that a lot of people might not think of when they're in that situation. Yeah, I'd say if you don't have a clear conscience going into it that's motivated on their behalf, it's going to come across that way and they're going to pick up on it. And so you have to you have to check any of that at the door. And if you're going to intervene and make a decision to intervene, it's best to do it authentically, best to make sure you have their their best intentions at heart. And I think genuinely, if you come in with that in mind, there's probably not a lot of bad stuff you could say to somebody. 
um, as long as you enter it with a respectful attitude and not assuming you know what's best necessarily, but yeah. making observations and coming at it with a loving heart, you could probably not say too much. It would be too bad. Yeah, that's good. That's comforting. <laughs> By this point in the episode, you've heard a lot about Zoom care. And maybe you're thinking, you know, I think it is about time I go see someone. Whether it's for your mental health, a physical injury, allergies, a COVID test, or a long list of other things, you can go to Zoom care. You can use them as your primary care doctor. And visits can range from online chat care to virtual video appointments to in-person treatment. They have locations in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Colorado. To make an appointment for yourself, go to zoomcare.com or download their mobile app. I love plants. You probably already knew that. But as of just a couple of years ago, I was convinced I would forever be a plant killer. That is until I met the plant doctors. They're two women, Chelsea and Skylar, in Portland, who love helping people and businesses figure out how to care for their plants. And they sell cute plants and adorable plant pots, too. They have brought lots of green beauty into my house. And they just launched something super fun a plant club. They're calling it the Clean Air Plant Club. Because, fun fact, plants actually do clean the air. For $20 a month, your subscription will get you a new four inch plant every month, plus 10% off all workshops and 10% off anything else you buy when you go pick up your plant in person. Go sign up for the Clean Air Plant Club right now at theplantdocs.com. And while you're on their website, if you feel like you need a new plant right now, which let's be honest, you probably do. Use the code Cassidy for 15% off your order. Again, code Cassidy at theplantdocs.com. Now back to the show. So you mentioned anxiety, depression, we talked about ADHD, you mentioned schizophrenia. What are some of the most common things that you see people coming in and asking for help for? Most of the time people coming in to Zoom will complain of um, anxiousness, anxiety, stress, sleep challenges, Ooh. anger problems, um, irritability, and um, concentration challenges, and, and just feeling forgetful and not being able to focus and not optimally performing. Those are the main things that we're seeing in, um, concerns for now, but we can pretty much address anything at Zoom. And a lot of times, people will come in for, and I, I've had people come in for very weird and unusual experiences they've had and asking if it's normal, if it's not, and that, that's totally fine. We've had people come in wondering how to come off of nicotine and get help with smoking cessation mm -hmm. and alcohol use. And I mean, the pandemic has been terrible for increasing rates of alcohol use. And so if you feel like your the your alcohol use is creating its own friction and you being present with your family, with your loved ones, if it's occupying your mind, if you're feeling guilty about um, engaging in too much to drink, if you're feeling like you should cut back, those are all perfectly rational reasons to come in for a consultation as well. We can handle all that stuff. Wow. Yeah. I would think that the pandemic... I mean, clearly it's created all kinds of problems, but definitely in the mental health space, does it seem that way as far as anxiety, depression, sleep yeah. issues? Were those just kind of inflated yeah. because of this? A hundred times, a hundred times or more. I think Great. That, um, the isolation <laughs> from this pandemic, I think the forced isolation in a way, uh, the removal of typical coping skills a lot of people depend upon has caused a lot of behavioral health concerns to flourish. And so we're seeing a lot more people who maybe were well managed with their mood before now finding that it's relapsed or that it's worse um, because of the pandemic. We're finding a lot of people who may have been struggling with just stress in the past have now flipped over into a full blown manifestation of symptoms that are really much more dysfunctional than just this, just managing with stress. And then a lot of people have just yeah. been having a lot more stress in their day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah. And we can help with all those things. Do you have any advice for some of those things? Like, let's say someone, besides coming in and getting help, obviously, there's one option. Sure, sure. But uh, if someone's still at home and they start struggling with, I guess, let's start with depression. <laughs> Like any advice for somebody struggling with depression and any things that you've 
you've learned that that help? Yeah, um, I go back to uh, my basic training in psychotherapy. Um, and one, one form of psychotherapy that I particularly love is called acceptance and commitment therapy. So I use that framework a lot when I'm thinking through even being mindful myself of what, what I'm experiencing and what I'm feeling. And I think in order to manage something like depressed feelings, you have to be able to first identify that you're having them. If you can't be aware that they're there in the first place, and they're just in the driver's seat and you're a passenger in your life and, and depression's mm. driving you around, it's gonna be very hard to figure out how to manage it. Yeah. So the first step is just being mindful and aware of how your emotions, how your thoughts or how your behaviors are impacting you being present in the present moment. And if you can't identify that, it's gonna be very hard to start anywhere. So you gotta start with that awareness and then once you have that awareness that it's there, you've got to lean into some tried and true mechanisms to dissolve those thoughts, feelings, behaviors, so that they just don't manifest into taking over your life as much. And there's a lot of cool tips and tricks for folks um, out there to kind of dissolve those feelings. And what you don't want to do is combat them. You don't want to assume they should just go away. The more you try to directly challenge them, the bigger they'll become. The important part about it is understanding that they're there, accepting that you're feeling a certain way, and then sorting through how you want to move about your life. What can you do in that present moment right then to get past it? Let's say in the evening, you're sitting on your couch, you're feeling like you should be calling your mom. And you're starting to feel guilty because you haven't checked in with mom in two weeks. And maybe this is my own personal uh, <laughs> feeling, but you're feeling guilty that you haven't checked in with your mom in two weeks. How are we going to fix that? You got to lean into the guilt. What is the guilt telling you? It's that you got to be present with your mom a little bit more. So, so you're going to write her a letter. You're going to call her right then. You're going to send her a text. How can you get to solving it? But it, it, it starts from first being aware of where it's coming from, where those motivations are. And sometimes they can be sneaky and kind of, hidden around the corner. It's hard to tune into them all the time. Totally. That seems, that advice seems pretty applicable, whether it's anxiety, depression, just noticing the thoughts. And that's really the first part to figuring it out for kind of everything. It is. Um, it's kind of like if you're, if um, being mindful is a way to kind of bail out your boat, if you're stuck out at sea and you got a leaky boat, <laughs> being mindful and aware of your emotions is kind of like bailing out your boat, but it, you're still going to be stuck out at sea and it's still going to keep on leaking unless you can start to patch it or get, get into shore. And so you've got to couple that mindfulness bailing out the boat with patching the boat up or going somewhere with it, um, getting into shore. So so that's where I think it's most effective. What can you do in that present moment? And if it's two in the morning and you're feeling guilty and you're not going to call mom, okay, that's cool. <laughs> Write it down. Come up with a game plan for when you're going to do it. You're up anyway. You might as well come up with a plan. So that's some, that's some basic advice and guidance I'd have. There's a lot of cool books and apps out there and a lot of resources available today. You kind of do it yourself and self-help things. Anything on acceptance and commitment therapy, I'm a big fan of. Oh, okay. If someone is interested in some books to read that, mm -hmm. do you have any recommendations? <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite books, especially for depression is called the happiness trap. And we recommend this. I don't own stock in it and I don't, I didn't write it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a fantastic read. I've never had a bad review and it's a very pragmatic approach to acceptance and commitment therapy. And then there's a couple of other uh, books. There's an act for dummies um, type book and some other things that can be just good layman's resources. What is that type of therapy? Uh, ac acceptance and commitment therapy? Yes. Yeah, um, so it's a, it's a newer form of cognitive behavioral therapy. So in the, in the tree of therapy, at the roots was this dude named Sigmund Freud, uh, who really started to look into the mind and try to define the inner processes of the mind. There were obviously many others who came along. But um, along the branches of figuring out psychotherapy, one large trunk is cognitive behavioral therapy. And then in a branch off of that cognitive behavioral therapy trunk, there's acceptance and commitment therapy which is a newer kind of a take on cognitive behavioral therapy. That's very interesting. One thing people might wonder is, so for Zoom care, they can come in in person or you said they can do chat, they can do a virtual appointment. And before I had done a virtual appointment, I was a little skeptical about it because I mean, I do this whole podcast on Zoom now, but 
it does sometimes seem a little awkward to have these tough conversations via a computer. From your perspective, have you seen any difficulties with that? Or what would you say to anyone who is a little skeptical of that? 98% of the scope of mental health care can be handled on video, in a video channel. I think that I, I mean, personally, I miss seeing people in person a little bit. I mean, when I'm working with somebody, there's body posture, there's body language that you can pick on, pick up on just a little bit more when you're in person that you can't do over the video. And then there's like bandwidth and connectivity challenges that sometimes just frustrate the process. But for the mm -hmm. most part, the vast majority of visits have clear, concise, uh, in sync bandwidth. And so that's not an issue. And I think most people would gladly trade the convenience of staying home in their jammies or having a, <laughs> right. a visit out in their car, as opposed to having to drive all the way across town, find parking, schlep themselves mm -hmm. into a clinic, um, be around others. It's just so much more convenient that I just don't see it going back. And as we get better and better bandwidth and 5G and whatever else is going out, uh, I think more and more people will be comfortable with video visits for, for especially for behavioral health. Totally. There's there's one good thing that's come out of the last year. We've all gotten very comfortable being on video chat. There you go. One thing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, I mean, um, um, I do miss in person, uh, being able to see people in person. Um, but again, you know, my main goal, our main goal at Zoom is to try and make care accessible. And, you know, when it's when it's on video, you can be pretty much anywhere in the state of Oregon um, for our licensed providers in Oregon. And you can be way over in a nook and cranny of the state. And if you've got Wi-Fi, man, we'll hook you up. Yes, that's awesome. So much has obviously changed in the healthcare field, the mental health field already. And I'm sure it continues to change all the time. What do you see, or I guess, what do you hope to see from the mental health care field as it progresses? Um, I think that we're going to continue to get better and better about delivering care and services and really dialing into understanding where somebody is in their recovery journey. You know, if you're doing great and really all you need is a refill on maybe a prescription that seems to really help you manage your mood every day. We want to be able to identify that quicker so that you don't need a whole visit to get that refill done mm -hmm. um, so that you can just like swipe right and get it sent out to you with hardly any questions asked. If you can show us that in fact, you're doing a lot better. And there's increasing an increasing amount of outcome measures and other things that we can start to rely on to really know how somebody's doing pretty well. Um, and we're going to continue to look into those types of opportunities so that we make it easier and more efficient for people to just easily manage where they're stuck. And if they're not stuck, our role and goal at Zoom is to try and get out of their hair to, to, to keep them unstuck and keep on living their life. That's our hope. Awesome. And then we just keep learning more about the brain and how it works, right? Do you see that just well, continuing there's, forever? Oh, yes. So I think um, there's two aspects to um, getting helping folks get healthier with their behavioral health concerns. One is just getting them access to good evidence-based care. And then another is improving that evidence-based care um, so that it gets better and better over time at either diagnosing things correctly or treating those things. And I see in the, I, I sincerely think behavioral health is the last frontier in medicine. The brain is the most complex organ in our body, head to toe. It's locked behind a vault of the blood brain barrier in your skull, and it makes it very difficult to study. And it's really only in the last 10 or 15 years we don't, we've been unable to unlock some tools and technology to really peer into the brain and understand its workings. Um, and that will give us more and more of an understanding of how these different syndromes come to be and uh, take over people's lives. And that will give us better insights into how we can address them more holistically and really help them move forward better. So I have a lot of confidence that there's a lot of very, very smart people, uh, smarter than me, working <laughs> on all those problems right now. And what Zoom is going to do is create the delivery system so that people can access those new developments when they're available. Um, but th that awesome. new that new treatment is not helpful if nobody can get it. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
that's where probably my biggest passion lies is in is in getting the pipeline better to the to the population. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> If you're loving this episode of Mentally Together, you might be curious. What goes on behind the scenes? Which parts of the conversation were left on the cutting room floor? Well, let's talk about it over on Patreon. My patrons get to see deleted video clips from every episode and get to be the first to ask questions of each podcast guest. Like from this episode. Clearly, I really enjoyed talking to Angel about skiing and anxiety and my experiences with both. So I had to tell her about a specific personal moment my anxiety kicked in in the mountains recently. So if you want to hear that and hear her extra piece of advice for me, it's on Patreon. Oh, and as one of my patrons, you get every episode of the show a day early on Sundays. You can read all about the different tiers and sign up at patreon.com slash Cassidy Quinn. Again, that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Cassidy Quinn. Okay, are you ready for the quick round? <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's do the it. The speed it. round. Let's, let's <laughs> when was the last time you cried? Oh, wow, that's a good one. I think it was watching a Pixar movie with my kids. Those Ooh. things, like, get me every time, and I, I cannot... I cannot, oh, no, no, no. What did we watch last weekend? <laughs> it wasn't Goonies. It was one of these old 80s. Oh, I know what it was. It wasn't a Pixar film. It was E.T. E.T. Okay, what about the last time you had a big belly laugh? The opposite. <laughs> oh, um, I think it was probably one of the other nights at dinner. Our, um, we have, I have a very vibrant and loving family. We have four <laughs> kids between the ages of eight and 12. And, um, <laughs> They're just hilarious. They're hilarious together. And it's always a bit of chaos at times around the dinner table. And so I can't remember what was happening, but we were all cracking up pretty good. That's awesome. What sound can calm you down and or bring you joy right when you hear it? Um, probably an ocean. Ooh, that's a good one. Very yeah, Oregon like answer waves, of you. Waves <laughs> on the ocean would be good, yeah. What about a smell? that does the same thing? Probably the scent of our laundry once it's done. Ooh, that's good. That's good motivation to do the laundry. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and maybe also the smell of our kids once they've taken that. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that, you know? They smell all clean and fresh and get the snuggle. It's good stuff. Aww. That's a great answer. What are you grateful for right now? Um, and I'm grateful I've got a job. Um, and I'm grateful that I get to do what I do on a daily basis. It's a real privilege to work in this team at Zoom Care. And it is a huge, it is a team. It's a growing team. It's a huge team. And we're really doing some really interesting stuff. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for that. And I'm really grateful for my wife. Oh. She's an amazing rock nice. in my life. <laughs> what is your best habit for your mental health that you do? Um, I wail on my guitar. <laughs> on my guitar. Ooh! <laughs> so I've got I've got an electric guitar, a couple yes. of electric guitars, and an acoustic guitar, and uh, and I, I play it loud to the chagrin of our neighbors and my <laughs> wife. Um, and uh, my son, one of my twin sons, plays drums, and uh, he has gotten better at uh, drumming lately, and so um, we will play pretty loud together, and that's that's uh, that really is a blast. That's great. What about your worst habit for your mental health that maybe you should stop doing? Or maybe since you're a professional, you don't have one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, everybody's got challenges. Um, you know, I at times get a little bit confuzzled between um, playing dad, playing um, my role at work, and sometimes don't do a good enough job delineating between the two. And so uh, when, I'm, when I've got my grumpy pants on at home, it's usually because I've got something on my mind from work and I need to just go put things down at home and go pay attention to that work stuff or vice versa, decide that I'm gonna be dad right now and do the work stuff at another time. Um, and that's probably my biggest fallacy sometimes is just in, um, you know, thinking about something else when, I'm, when I should be playing a different role. Yeah, that's gotta be tough. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sometimes it's a little hard, and this year's this year's made it harder. <laughs> Pandemic's yeah. been a lot of work, a lot of a lot of worry, a lot of um, stress. Yeah. 
thank you for doing all the work through it. <laughs> well, again, it's a big privilege. Like I said. What is your biggest guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure? Um, again, I probably have to go back to the guitar. Like, man, I really like it when that thing is loud. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that impacts others around the house, um, but I really like it when it's loud. <laughs> Sounds therapeutic, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's a, it hits a lot of chords, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> yes, <laughs> dad jokes, I love it, I love it. Yeah, so <laughs> that's where I am in life. <laughs> what is your favorite thing about your brain? Um, I, I actually don't think I'm that smart. <laughs> my favorite thing about my brain is that I have a good ability to think simply about things. Um, and I try to think, starting from the big picture of stuff, what's the root cause of this issue? And then I try to think hard about that. And as long as I can put that in line with the detailed cause over here, I'm really good, I think, about connecting those two things um, and understanding, really, for an issue, what is the underlying challenge that's bringing this up? And we can address that issue now, but how can I really start to work towards addressing those underlying issues? Because I understand that this thing over here is just a symptom of this over here. And I and for those of you who are playing the video game or the audio game only, I'm holding my hands up. <laughs> so Cassidy <laughs> might be able to say, you've got something over here that's like a day-to-day -day concern. It's really the vestige of some bigger problem over here. Um, and I think I'm good about intuiting those things. That makes sense. That's awesome. If you wrote a biography right now, what would it be called? Oh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Eric Vanderlip, you know, rock star stuck in a psychiatrist's body, something like that. <laughs> That's good. I want to read that book. I'm I'm intrigued. When do you feel most yourself? Uh, when I'm probably putting the kids to bed at night <laughs> and we're getting to hang out. And it's like, uh, we have this thing where I show like the boys a, a music video or something like that before we go to bed, we pick something out. And I try to expand their musical knowledge and taste uh, by selecting artists that I like, and they always don't like that. But <laughs> I feel like I get to show them a piece of me. And, um, and I get to be authentic with, with the kids in that way. I mean, I do that a lot with my wife, but she already knows that stuff. So that's <laughs> what comes to mind right now. I love that. Okay, and the last one is definitely the most random. If you had to get something tattooed on your forehead, like everyone's doing it now, it's just a thing in the future. Everyone is getting a message on their forehead that can be to yourself in the mirror. It can be like your billboard to the world. What would your forehead tattoo say? <laughs> It feels even more ridiculous saying it to a doctor. <laughs> no, it's all right. Actually, I had a mentor of mine who said that if you ever really want to quickly get into understanding somebody, ask them about their tattoos. Ooh, and it yeah. has never failed. You're in the ER, they've been brought in for being suicidal, they hate you, they're not sure they want to be there at all. Ask them about their tattoo. It's an instant window into somebody's life. It's an important thing. You're going to put something on your forehead permanently. Right. And now you have to. Everybody's I, just doing it. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, I don't have tattoos myself. Me I would probably because of exactly I this, would, the commitment phobia. Yeah. <laughs> I'd probably put a circle. I don't know if it would even say anything, but I love the beauty of just a perfect circle. Um, that it's balanced, that it's continuous and infinite. I love the concept of pi. I think that's just a fascinating concept mathematically. And so, yeah, it probably just, it, and people would be like, is this like for a hole in your head or what? I don't understand, <laughs> but uh, that's probably what I'd go for. If I had to do something on my body or um, my, my forehead, I'd go for it. I like it. That's a cool. Yeah, cool but the answer. artist better do it perfectly as a perfect circle. Like, I don't want it even oh, ocular yeah. at all. Like, it's <laughs> gonna have to be exactly right on. Um, oh, yeah, that makes so. me nervous just thinking about that now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then so. anything else that you wish people knew about Zoom care or you or mental health in general? 
You know, I'd, I'd say that I wish that people understood that Zoom was a much more complete ecosystem than they often think it is at first blush. It is a different philosophy of delivering care. And even though Zoom, the word Zoom in our name suggests that it's quick, superficial, or frivolous, it's actually anything but. We manage a lot of very complex conditions and we have amazing clinicians that are ready to think differently about how we're going to serve a person and put them in charge of their health. So I think if you are a person who wants, who's sick of having providers tell you what to do, who's sick of not having any control over your health, and you want a team to really partner with you to get better and healthier, um, I think Zoom cares nice to go. Great description. Thank you. And thank you, wonderful human, for listening to this episode of Mentally Together. We release new episodes every Monday, so I, Cassidy Quinn, will see you next week. In the meantime, go do something nice for your brain today. Go see a doctor, play the guitar, read a book, whatever will make your day just a little bit better. And if seeing a professional might help your day and your brain feel a little bit better, and you live in Oregon, Washington, Idaho, or Colorado, give ZoomCare a try. Just go to zoomcare.com or download their mobile app to make an appointment. Because remember, we are all just trying to keep ourselves mentally together. Mentally Together is produced, hosted, and edited by Cassidy Quinn in collaboration with Koba FM, a podcast network that is all about community, baby.